Thank everyone. Thank you very much for coming together so that we can immerse ourselves in this wonderful body of wisdom we call Torah that we receive and that we add to as well. We are in Parshat Shoftim, which is in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 16, beginning with verse 18. We'll read through the English translation, then I'll share with you a focused study about it, and then we'll open it up for our collective collaborative conversation about it. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute at this time together, we can recite the blessing, giving thanks for this moment. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity this for this moment to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. I'll share with you the opening verses, and then I'll invite others to have an opportunity to read as well beginning Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18. You shall appoint magistrates and officials for your tribes in all the settlements that Adonai your God is giving you, and they shall govern the people with due justice. You shall not judge unfairly. You shall show no partiality. You shall not take bribes, for bribes blind the eyes of the discerning and upset the plea of the just. Justice, justice shall you pursue, that you may thrive and occupy the land that Adonai your God is giving you. You shall not set up a sacred post, any kind of pole beside the altar of Adonai your God that you may make, or erect a stone pillar, for such Adonai your God detests. Richard, would you like to continue at the very start of chapter 17? Thank you. You shall not sacrifice uh, to Adonai an ox or a sheep that is any defect of a serious kind, for that is abhorrent to the Lord your God. If there is found among you in one of the settlements which the Lord your God is giving you, a man or woman who has affronted the Lord your God and transgressed his covenant, turning to the worship of other gods and bowing down to them, to the sun or the moon or any of the heavenly host, something I never commanded and you have been informed or have learned of it, then you shall make a thorough inquiry. If it is true, the fact is established that abhorrent thing was perpetuated in Israel. You shall take the man or the woman who did the wicked thing out to the public place and you shall stone them, man or woman, to death. A person shall be put to death on the testimony of two or more witnesses he must not be put to death on the testimony of a single witness. Let the hands of the witnesses be the first against him to put him to death, and the hands of the rest of the people thereafter, this you will sweep out evil from your midst. Thank you. And June, would you like to continue there at verse 8? Thank you, Rabbi. If a case is too baffling for you to decide, be it a controversy over homicide, civil law, or assault, matters of dispute in your courts, you shall promptly repair to the place that the Lord your God will have chosen and appear before the Levitical priests or the magistrate in charge at the time and present your problem. When they have announced to you the verdict in the case, you shall carry out the verdict that is announced to you from that place that the Lord chose observing scrupulously all their instructions to you. You shall act in accordance with the instructions given you and the ruling handed down to you. You must not deviate from the verdict that they announce to you, either to the right or to the left. Should a man act presumptively and disregard the priest charged with serving there, the Lord your guard or the magistrate, that man shall die. Thus you will sweep out evil from Israel, all the people will hear and be afraid and will not act presumptively again. Thank you so much. And let me invite Margo, if you'd like to continue at verse 14 for a little reading. Thank you. After you have entered the land that the Lord God has assigned to you and taken possession of it and settled in it, you decide, hey, 
I will, I will set a king over me as do all the nations about me. If you shall be free, if you shall be free to set a king over yourselves, one chosen by the Lord your God, be sure to set as king over yourself one of your own people. You must not set, set a foreigner over you, um, o- over you, one who is not one of your kinsmen. Moreover, he shall not keep many horses. <clears throat> uh, wait, I, I think I turned two pages. No, maybe not. And send and uh, send people back to Egypt, as did the as um, to add to his horses. Since the Lord has since the Lord has warned you, you must not go back that way again. Um, and he shall not have many wives kept, uh, lest his heart go astray. And and, and now, uh, nor shall he amass silver and gold in excess. When, when he is seated on his royal throne, he shall have a copy of this teaching written for him on the scroll by by uh, develop by the Levitical priests. Let it remain with him, and let him read it all his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord God, to observe faithfully every word of his teachings as well as these laws thus he he will not act haughtingly or uh toward his fellows or deviate from the instructions to the right or to the left to the end to that end that he and his descendants may reign long in the midst of israel thank you margo Mark Levinson, you want to continue there at the start of chapter 18? Thank you, Rabbi. The Levitical priests, the whole tribe of Levi, shall have no territorial portion with Israel. They shall live only off the Lord's offerings by fire as their portion, and shall have no portion among their brothers' tribes. The Lord is their portion, as he promised them. This then shall be the priest's due from the people. Everyone who offers a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, must give the shoulder, the cheeks, and the stomach to the priest. You shall also give him the first fruits of your new grain and wine and oil, and the first shearing of your sheep. For the Lord your God has chosen him and his descendants out of all your tribes to be in attendance for service in the name of the Lord for all time. If a Levite would go from any of the settlements throughout Israel where he has been residing to the place where the Lord has chosen, he may do so whenever he pleases. He may serve in the name of the Lord his God like all his fellow Levites who are there in attendance before the Lord. They shall receive equal shares of the dues without regard to personal gifts or patrimonies. When you enter the land that is the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to imitate the important practices of those nations. Let no one be found among you who consigns his son or daughter to the fire or who is an augur, a soothsayer, a diviner, a sorcerer, one who casts spells, or one who consults ghosts of familiar spirits, and one who inquires of the dead. For anyone who does such things is abhorrent to the Lord, and it is because of these important things that the Lord your God is dispossessing them before you. You must be wholehearted with the Lord your God. Those nations that you are about to dispossess do indeed resort to soothsayers and augurs. To you, however, the Lord your God is not assigned the like. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me invite uh, Jim. Would you like to continue that verse 15? Thank you, Rabbi. Adonai your God will raise up for you a prophet from among your own people, like myself. Him you shall heed. This is just what you asked of Adonai your God uh, at Horeb on the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear the voice of Adonai my God any longer or see the wondrous fire anymore, lest I die. Whereupon the Adonai said to me, they have done well in speaking. Thus I will raise up 
the prophet for them among their own people like yourself. I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them all that I command him. And if anybody fails to heed the words he speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But any prophet who presumes to speak in my name, an oracle that I did not command him to utter, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And should you ask yourselves, how can we know that the oracle was not spoken by Adonai? If the prophet speaks in the name of Adonai and this oracle does not come true, that oracle was not spoken by Adonai. The prophet has uttered its presumptuously, do not stand in dread of him. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Norm, would you like to continue at the very start of chapter 19? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> when your God Adonai has cut down the nations whose land your God Adonai is assigning to you, and you have dispossessed them and settled in their towns and homes, you shall set aside three cities in the land that you your God Adonai is giving you to possess. You shall survey the distance and divide into three parts the territory of the country that your God Adonai has allotted to you so that you may, so that any man who has killed someone may have a place to flee to. Now, this is the case of the killer who may flee there and live, one who has slain another unwittingly without having been an enemy in the past. For instance, a man goes with another man into a grove to cut wood, and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree. The axe head flies off the handle and strikes the other so that he dies. That man shall flee to one of the cities and live. Otherwise, when the distance is great, the blood avenger pursuing the killer in hot anger may not overtake him and strike him down. Yet he did not incur the death penalty since he had never been the other's enemy. That is why I command you, set aside three cities. And when your God Adonai enlarges your territory as was sworn to your fathers and gives you all the land that was promised to be given to your fathers, you should faithfully observe all this instruction that I adjoin upon you this day, to love your God Adonai and to walk in God's ways in all times, then you shall add three more towns to those three. The blood of the innocent shall not be shed, bringing blood guilt upon you in the land that your God Adonai is allotting to you. Thank you, Noor. Dave, would you like to continue there at verse 11 of chapter 19? If, uh, however... A man who is the enemy of another lies in wait, sits upon the victim, and strikes a fatal blow, and then flees to uh, one of these towns. The elders of his town shall have him brought back from there, and shall hand him over to the blood avenger to be put to death. You must show him no pity. Uh, thus you will purge Israel of the blood of the innocent, and it will go well with you. You shall not uh, move your neighbor's landmarks set up by uh, previous generations in the property that will be allowed to you in the land that your God is giving you to possess. A single witness may not validate against an accused party any guilt or blame for any offense that may be committed. A case can be valid only on the testimony of two witnesses or more. If someone appears against another party to testify maliciously and gives incriminating yet false testimony, the two parties to the dispute shall appear before Adonari, before the priests or magistrates in authority at that time, and the magistrate shall make a thorough investigation. If the one who testified is a false witness, having testified falsely against a fellow Israelite, you shall do to the one as the one schemed to do to the other. Thus you will sweep out evil from your midst 
Others will hear and be afraid, and such evil things will not again be done in your midst. Nor must you show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Thank you very much, Dave. And Jay, would you like to continue at the very start of chapter 20? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Rabbi. When you take the field against your enemies and see horses and chariots, horses larger than yours, have no fear of them. For the Anoy your God who brought you from the land of Egypt is with you. Before you in battle, the priest shall come forward and address the troops. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are about to join battle with your enemy. Let not your courage falter. Do not be in fear or in panic or in dread of them. For it is Adonai who marches with you to do battle for you against your enemy to bring you victory. Then the official shall address the troops as follows. Is there anyone who has built a new house but has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his home, lest he die in battle, and another dedicated. Is there anyone who has planted a vineyard but has never harvested it? Let him go back to his home, lest he die in battle, and another harvest it. Is there anyone who has paid the bride price for a wife, but who has not yet married her? Let him go back to his home, lest he die in battle, and another marry her. The officials shall go on addressing the troops and say, is there anyone afraid or disheartened? Let him go back home, lest the courage of his comrades flag like his. When the officials have finished addressing the troops, army commanders shall assume command of the troops. Thank you so much, Jay. Robert, would you like to continue there at verse 10? Yes, thank you. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be. And if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Thou shalt, thus, thou, thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. Thank you so much, Robert. Let me invite David and Susan. Would you like to continue at this chapter, uh, verse 19, and then take us into chapter 21 as well? Thank you, Rabbi. When in your war against a city, you have to besiege it a long time in order to capture it, you must not destroy its trees, wielding the axe against them. You may eat of them, but you must not cut them down. Are trees of the field humans to withdraw before you into the besieged city? Only trees that you know do not yield food may be destroyed. You may cut them down for constructing, sorry, for constructing siege works against the city that is waging war on you until it has been reduced. If in the land that your God Hashem is assigning to you to possess, someone slain is found lying in the open. The identity of the slayer not being known, 
your elders and magistrates shall go out and measure the distance from the corpse to the nearby towns. The elders of the town nearest to the corpse shall then take their take a heifer, which has never been worked, which has never pulled a yoke. And the elders of that town shall bring the heifer down to an overflowing wadi, which is not tilled or sown. There in the wadi, they shall break the heifer's neck. The priests, sons of Levi, shall come forward. For your God Hashem has chosen them for divine service and to pronounce blessing in the name of Hashem. And every lawsuit in case of assault is subject to their ruling. Then all the elders of the town nearest the corpse shall wash their hands over the heifer's over wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the wadi, and they shall make this declaration. Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Absolve Hashem, your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, and do not let guilt for the blood of the innocent remain among your people Israel. And they will be absolved of blood guilt. Thus you will remove from your midst guilt for the blood of the innocent, and you shall be doing what is right in the sight of Hashem. Thank you so much, and everyone, thank you, everyone. That's our complete Torah portion for the week. I'd like to share with you a bit of focused study about it. If you have a copy of the study sheet, I invite you to take it out at this time. This is a, a, a portion that is uh, full of a, a variety of topics and instructions. We, we began by describing really a governance structure uh, to consist of judges, uh, potentially a king, priests, prophets, all of whom have a role to play in the overall governance of the community. Uh, there was a mention made of these cities of refuge to which someone who has been accused of uh, killing someone can flee to uh, while the, the matter gets sorted out. Uh, there are rules about warfare, rules about uh, um, raising an army. Uh, and then what we just read having to do with how to address uh, an unresolved murder that's occurred uh, in, between, in between villages. So it, it's a lot of material. And I'd like to focus on something that caught my eye uh, really for the first time after all these years of, of reading this Torah portion. And that has to do with the, the verb to pursue. So uh, in number one on our study sheet, I take one of those times that uh, it, it came up and that had to do with this notion about setting up these uh, cities of sanctuaries of refuge and about the, the avenger who's out to, to kill someone that that person has, has believes has killed one of their own kinsmen. So here, number one, lest the avenger of the, blo of the blood pursue, in Hebrew, a, a year dof, the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him and strikes him to death. Yet he was not deserving of death. That is why I command you, set aside three cities. So in number two, I give you the, the, the root for the word uh, pursue, uh, radaf, which means to pursue, to chase after. And we've seen this verb a number of times previously um, in the book of Leviticus, and I, I have those here also in, in number three. And it creates a quite a... Uh, an image, these verses. The sound of a rustling leaf will pursue them. They will flee as one flees the sword, and they will fall even though there's no pursuer. Everyone will stumble over one another, fleeing as if from the sword, but without a pursuer. And you won't be able to stand up against your enemies. You will become lost among the nations, and the land of your enemies will consume you. So this is in the context of a series of verses that, in which the, 
God is describing what will happen if the people do not live uh, in accordance with, in, in synchronicity with uh, the divine, if you will, design of the universe and, and how people are, are to live. And if people don't live in accordance with that design, then there'll be this, this description here of, of people who are constantly looking over their shoulder, constantly anxious, uh, uh, paranoid, full of fear, running away, even though there's no one really chasing them. Somehow, they're internally, all, all they're aware of is, is a sense of being pursued. And then here from Book of Proverbs, we have the same uh, verb, uh, rodef, that uh, we encountered from Proverbs uh, chapter 28, verse 1. The wicked flee, though no one pursues. It is almost as if this is a, there's some kind of disease that afflicts those who are harming others, who are doing wrong in the world, who are committing crimes, who are, who are rapacious and, and, and who are engaged in, in taking advantage of others, that when they act this way, they begin to distort their own internal sense of, of settlement and, and well-being. And they are in constant fear of being chased, of being pursued. So this is one of the images that we get from the, the verb to pursue, both here in our portion from the book of Leviticus and, and here from the book of, of Proverbs. But the word pursue comes up in, in another point in our Torah portion, and I've got that on number four on the backside of our study sheet. Justice, justice shall you pursue, Tirdof that you may live and inherit the land that Adonai, your God, is giving to you. So justice, justice that you pursue is not, here is not so much a sense of chasing after something that one cannot attain. My image rather is the emphasis and the notion of pursuing is this is how you are to act all the time, constantly, you're constantly in motion of, of living a life of, of restoration, of balance, of righteousness, of compassion, and of doing good in the world. And that is a sense in which, a new sense in which to, uh, the verb to pursue is being used here. In a positive sense, uh, a, a life that is free of anxiety, a life that is only doing good in the world. <clears throat> and a similar notion for the verb to pursue that's positive is raised in Psalm. It's actually in Psalm 23. Only goodness and loving kindness shall pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of Adonai for the length of my years. Psalm 23 conveys a sense of someone who is, if you will, plugged into the energy of the universe, who has, who is living a life that is in harmony with the way the universe is supposed to work, and who has a, a life of contentment, <clears throat> self-resolve, and when one lives that way, all that one is accompanied by uh, is a sense of goodness and loving kindness. So. When I look at those two different ways in which uh, the verb to pursue is being used in our portion and, and elsewhere, I have a sense in which the negative aspect of uh, the pursuit has to do with uh, when one becomes so absorbed in one's emptiness that one seeks to take away things from other people. Uh, one becomes overly uh, avarice. So you become rapacious, you become harmful of others. And so there's a need uh, to begin to restrain that, uh, that impulse. And in a sense, that's what the, the city of refuge is doing. The, the text recognizes that there will be moments when our blood will become boiling 
and, and, and our emotions will, will take over uh, our, our cognitive, uh, rational thought. And it's at that moment, says Torah, we need to have some kind of level of both sanctuary for those who are, who are the, being the objects of, of this kind of outpouring of wrath, and we need to have some way to also restrain and calm down the one who has, whose blood has begun to boil. So I want to share a little bit about this notion of, of restraint. Uh, and here is from uh, Anne Bogart, who is a, a theater director, and she wrote an article about the art of restraint. And she wrote, following blind impulses is about short-term gain, narrow and selfish, immature and irresponsible. One of the fundamental tools in making art is restraint. Restraint implies restriction, and I would like to propose that restrictions inherent in every creative process are ultimately one's ally. Most successful artists understand the importance of restraint applied in moments of great excitement. Now, I want to acknowledge that uh, Anne Bogart is someone who is particularly steeped in Japanese theater, and, and she has assimilated a lot of the lessons from, from that culture and from that way uh, of doing theater. Because we can think of many artists who, who are, in a sense, uh, uh, are not uh, engaged in restraint. But th this is uh, it's a way for me to, to take you into an artist in the United States, who was particularly defined by his level of restraint, uh, and, and that is Edward Hopper. So uh, Edward Hopper, who was born about uh, 1882, he dies in 1967. He's born uh, in Nyack, New York, which is along the, the Hudson River, and uh, he grows up and he's very interested in, in art. His family tries to encourage him not to go in the direction of fine art, of making paintings, but doing something that's more practical, of becoming an illustrator, which he tries for a while and is very discontented with it. And eventually he, he goes on to art school. And, and in particular, when he's about, let's see, in 20 or in his 20s, he goes to, to France and he becomes enwrapped to, with uh, the Impressionists and. And he says, oh, that's, that's who I am, uh, someone who, who is enthralled by the play of light and, and by taking scenes of everyday life and being able to, to present them in a way that uh, captures people's imaginations. Well, what uh, Edward Hopper does is he grows up during this time when uh, the, the country, the United States, is going through some very significant changes. Uh, in 1920, the 1920 uh, uh, census is the first time that the census uh, acknowledges that there's been a major shift in the population within the United States, that there are now more people living in cities than there are people uh, li living in rural land. And, and that begins to set off what is already a sense of dissettlement and unease, a shift in identity and real transformations, not only in uh, national life, but also down to gray, very granular basic level of family life where families start to shift a, a, and change as well. And in fact, uh, to be honest, it's, these are still dynamics that we're still working through in, in this country, the kind of cultural and familial shifts that have happened as we've gone from an agrarian society to, to an urban society. Well. Uh, Edward Hopper becomes really the chronicler, if you will, the, the expressor of these and observer of these kinds of, of shifts. He spends most of his time either in New York uh, or uh, in New England, and in particular, eventually he and his wife Joe they they have a home in on Cape Cod in Truro, Cape Cod, and he his style is such that it's very spare. It's very still, it's very um, silent. There are often, sometimes there are no human figures whatsoever. 
and and the the, the landscape uh, kind of speaks of a certain emptiness, a certain, if you will, transitoriness, a sense in which not quite sure whether what exists, this building, this train station, this bridge is going to exist for much longer, and what it means to go from one place to another. And in those uh, paintings that he did, where there are individuals, sometimes it's very few people, uh, one person, two people, three people. Uh, many of you are familiar with his painting that he did in around 1940, 42, Nighthawks of the individuals at a night cafe in, in New York. Who are, and people there, those four figures in that particular painting are all there, but they don't seem to be engaged with one another. They seem to be in their own worlds. So uh, Hopper takes this very restrained, quiet, um, spare approach uh, to kind of give us an opportunity to ourselves become uh, silent, to become uh, minimal, uh, to become still, perhaps as a way to engage with the images that he's bringing to us, to kind of shut out all the, the hustle, the bustle, to, to shut out the, the, the movement that is all around us in mid-20th century uh, America, and just to be still and contemplate and perhaps engage and perhaps pay attention uh, to what's before him and before us on his canvas. So here I've shared with you his painting uh, that he did called Cape Cod Morning. And that's his wife uh, who served as a model for many of his paintings. And there she is. Uh, she is staring out of this bay window, this home on Cape Cod. You can see the, the grass, the trees, the sky. And then one ponders is she looking out at something that is coming towards her? Is she looking out at something that seems to be beyond reach? Is she looking out at something that no longer exists? Is she looking out at something that's coming into existence? And so I, for us, uh, this notion that, uh, that Hopper was engaged in this level of kind of quiet and stillness, as a way for us to kind of take stock of where we are and whom we're with and to spend time with this figure uh, and to allow ourselves to get to know her and perhaps to, to get to know ourselves better as a result. Hopper, Hopper would, by the, towards the end of his life, with his approach of simplicity, stillness, quiet, restraint, and if you will, self-effacement. Um, he, he, he once said, I, let's say I wrote down, he said, uh, I don't think I exist really as a person, particularly, I, and I really, really don't, and I'd rather not. So this, this sense of um, self-effacement will quickly go out of artistic style. Because by the 1940s, his kind of flatness and restraint and stillness is being displaced by a very vigorous, very robust, very gestular, uh, and uh, certainly at the beginning, very masculine in, in the sense of, of uh, presenting oneself out in the world a form of art, abstract expressionism. So his, his way, as if we can say, the way of, of the world that he was more fond of, perhaps, a quieter, simpler world, is being displaced by a, a more vigorous, dominant world uh, in which abstract expressionism takes root primarily because New York City uh, displaces Paris as the center of the art world. And it does so because the United States becomes the dominant power at that time after World War II. So these are interesting shifts that are being, uh, re that are resulting from these uh, 
political and, and social uh, effects. But what I'm interested in uh, in the moment is this notion about uh, the restraint and the quiet and the solitude and the stillness that Edward Hopper is presenting to us as a way to begin to reflect on our world and ourselves in it. And then I have this poem from Rilke. Space reaches out from us and translates the world. To know a tree in its true element, throw inner space around it from that pure abundance in you. Surround it with restraint. It has no limits, not till it is held in your renouncing is it truly there. So here are these Israelites. They're about to go and, and leave behind the only existence that they've known for generations, that of the wilderness, where God has provided for them, taken care of them, and now they're about to cross over into something that they can possess. That will be their responsibility. And I can imagine that they must be feeling both a measure of excitement and a measure of anxiety. And so at this moment, Torah seems to be providing this message in multiple ways. That if you really want to honor that which you have been, that which has been bestowed to you, you can't dominate it. You can't seek to control it. You have to renounce it if you want it to be truly present. And that is the way to be present as well. So with that, I'd love to know what you experienced and what you saw in the course of our uh, reading our portion. Rose, you've got your hand raised, so please share with us. That's right, I'm very quick. Um, I'd like to recommend, uh, since you were talking, uh, Rabbi, about Hopper and you know his kind of landscape, is the musical accompaniment is Aaron Copeland's Quiet City. Ah. And in Thank fact, you. it's actually been used. Uh, uh, sometimes they'll show Hopper's pictures when, when there's a video of Quiet City. So I would certainly um, recommend that. Um, I th I think that you know there there is a, a light motif of being zealous to uh, in judgment to find the truth, but also kind of putting the brakes on that you have to have extra witnesses. The blood vengeance it sounds like go proceeds by centuries. Um, that's a very ancient tribal law, clearly. And, you know, it's mandated that just as the kinsman needs to redeem somebody's land, you know, if it goes into hawk or redeem a slave or whatever, that they also have to avenge a debt. So clearly, you know, this goes way back. But again, I think it recognizes that, yeah, this is still going to go on. This is not something we're going to get rid of because this mandate goes way, way back. And people, you know, it's tribal law. But we're going to modify it by, you know, giving this place where people can hide out and find refuge. So that's kind of interesting. The one area that troubles me is where they're talking about attacking a city that's outside of Canaan that basically, I mean, I'm not even sure why they're attacking it, except that this is some imperialist thing that they're just attacking the city. Well, yes, they have to have the siege. It sounds like, oh, aren't they nice? And you know, that they leave the trees and all this stuff. But why are they attacking in the first place? They're condoning imperialism, you know, expansion for expansion's sake. So that's the only thing that I kind of 
Hmm. It doesn't ring right. But the other things are really saying, yeah, you have to pursue justice. And I think that they're also saying they're not blaming the blood avenger for pursuing the the guy, the manslaughter person, because they're saying, you know, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. But they're tempering it and saying, you know, this is an off-ramp. The need for two witnesses is an off-ramp. And point of fact, very few people, capital punishment, from my understanding, was extremely rare because you had to have two witnesses. They had to warn the guy not to kill the other guy. You know, so it's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. So. I made some lovely notes. Thank you very much about the Aaron Copeland piece in particular. Uh, thank you for focusing on the, these other aspects of restraint. And, and I have some things I'll say uh, to add to that contribution in just a moment. But let me call upon Catherine and then Robert. And oh, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rabbi. Um, one thing which I found interesting is that there's a fairly modern idea of justice here, mm. of justice as fairness, which is a modern idea, and um, that fairness is somehow built into the way that people should comport themselves. And that in a sense, I also sense that um, uh, in this parsha that, uh, people can govern themselves to some extent if they follow this idea of fairness that um, they don't need to wait for magistrate necessarily, but that they can govern themselves. So I found that interesting. Fantastic. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to come back to some of those points as well in just a moment. Let me call upon Robert and then Jay. Well, thank you again for a lovely evening. So for me, what we read tonight is a weekend. Yes, sir. A weekend. There's so much in here that is relevant with so many ramifications to our own world. And I uh, reviewed it actually before uh, tonight, uh, earlier today, and I thought, my goodness, there's just so much in here. And I'll just stop at the first four lines. Because, you know, uh, what we see, and at least what I see in the Torah, those teachings that have to do with that time, those social laws that were essential to maintain order, unity. And I think we're all tuned in tonight on this concept of justice. So I'll just, just the first four lines. And they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Now, the reason I share these, when I first looked at these earlier in the day, it was like somebody throwing a stone in my face. This is exactly what governments today, I'm not going to mention any governments, but many governments suffer from. Because when we have this in hand, you know, and they did a study with, with physicians, by the way, when they got free samples, they actually, and the, and, the, and the physicians honestly felt that they didn't show any bias towards those medications. But when they actually did the statistics, they found, oh, I'm sorry, when you did get these trips, et cetera, et cetera, it did make a difference. So here we have money with regard to those who are in power, which is in a way the whole idea of power in this world to me is ridiculous. God has power. We're servants. We're, we're delusional when we think we have power. That's just my own take. So to me, these teachings 3,500 plus years ago are eternal. 
And we find these in all the great religions. And here we go. Thursday night, we have to go back 3,500 years to see what's wrong in part with the world. Now, many of us knew this anyhow. This is nothing new to us. And this last uh, uh, sentence I read, I think has implications. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees. Trees are material. Yes, they give life, etc., but not near the altar. Do not put the material things on or upon or near the altar. In other words, that altar inside as well as the other altar. Don't let, don't let those worldly things confuse the sanctity. The other thing is that, that came up uh, was the idea of witnesses. And I thought I would trace this historically. So here we have two or three witnesses. Praise be to God, no gender mentioned. That was a man-dominated world, a male-dominated world at that time. But we see that Moses gave some rights to women. Now, when you go to Islam, it's more specific. And if anyone who is a Muslim tells you that men and women are equal in Islam, remind them that in the Quran, their holy book, which Baha'is respect fully, it takes two women and only one man to be a just witness. That is not equality. When we go to the Baha'i writings, now remember in the Torah, we had it gender free and the uh, no mention of it, by the way, in Christianity. When we get to the uh, Quran, we have two against one. In the Baha'i writings, it says two just witnesses. And justice in the Baha'i faith is defined as each one receiving his due. I buy an ice cream for $3, I give them $3, it's justice. $4, it's mercy. The $1 is mercy. I give him $2, I'm trying to cheat him. So, and then the last thing, I know, I know I'm going on and on about this, is this painting. So I think if I were to see this painting, have seen this painting in a different environment, where I'm just casually looking at it, I would say it's very flat. But what I've learned, what I've learned on Thursday nights is never to look at art like that. Because some art just talks to me. You know, it's obvious, like architecture, poetry, people, whatever. But I kept looking at this. I thought, you know, this is very interesting. Everything is still, and I really appreciate the way you laid this out. Everything is still and quiet. But there are only four things that are clearly defined. One of them is a bay window, and that's looking forward to see something we can't see. The grass and the trees know precisely where to go. They're reaching out for the sky. Their creator is the sun, if you will. And what is this woman looking at? It's still, it's quiet. She's living in comfort. When our hearts are still and quiet, and we have peace, that's when we can search for truth and purpose and meaning. And that's what I see in this. There's quietness. Nature is fulfilling what God has asked it to do. She's looking now for something more. She's in a material realm. She's comfortable, lovely. But now it's quiet and still. What is it that life is about? Why am I here? So anyhow, Thank that's... You. Yes. Thank you, Robert. Let me, thank you, Robert, so much. I'm going to uh, come back to a couple of those points in a second here. And Richard. Yes. Uh, none of us are going to make it out of here alive. But I like this portion because... Thank you for that. <laughs> don't, and don't forget it. Because what are you we're able to, to do with our time and what this is telling believe is that there's two pursuits. One is the pursuit of the capacity to hold compassion. And another is pursuit of justice. And there are two sides of the single coin. And that's what we have in this world is the opportunity to balance those. And at the end of our days, if we've done that, it's been a life worth living, not making it a world where that can always happen forever and ever. And 
The second part of what I have to say is that I see the woman looking out there and not just looking at nature, but that she's open and her heart is open and she is receiving everything from the other side, from what created the world. And that's pulsing through her and she is appreciating the bush that is ever burning or the nothingness that's turned into the material world. And she's not struck away by it, but she's enjoying it while she's here instead of bitching about it. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Richard. Uh, let me call upon Jay and Norm. Go ahead, Jay. Rabbi, uh, the uh, word Rodef, uh, each year, I believe, it reminds me there are synagogues, Rodef Shalom, pursuers yeah. of peace. And um, there's a passive aspect and then there's an active passive. You just as just as shall thou pursue. You don't accept things as as they are. You have to pursue the better, you have to pursue more meaning. Um, the second thing that came to mind was a uh, a trip that I took to Israel when, when my uh, daughter Beth was spending a year there in year course in I believe 1996 and a, and a, a, young, a man in our community, a, a, my, a little older than me, he and a, and, a, and a young lady I knew in the community in, in Montebello in that area had made Aliyah several years before and we went to visit them and he became a, a psychologist and he was writing a book. And I believe that his um, one of his main charges in the prison system there in Israel was that there were Islamic, obviously I believe Islamic, or there were men who were serving long, hard sentences because they had carried out, they were required to carry out bloodlust. So that was his that was his theme of whatever book he was working on, is that you have uh here, you know, men who or, or I believe they were only men they were, they were there in, in, in prison because they were required to, to commit the killing. And, and, and that, well, that, that also, this, this uh, Harsha brings that to me. But I'm reading from uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Eitz Chaim uh, book. It was interesting that there's a quote about the trees and pretty profound that that many years ago, that many years ago, or even in Genesis, it says, we are not to be so carried away in time of war that we forget the war will be over one day and people will have to live and feed their families in the place where the battles are not raging, are now raging. Beyond that, Maimonides writes, not only one who cuts down a fruit tree, but anyone who destroys household goods, tears clothing, demolishes a building, stops at the spring or ruins food deliberately, violates the prohibition of Baal, Tashit, you must not destroy. Many legal systems, including the laws of the United States, permit people to destroy their own property. Jewish law teaches us that we are only the custodians, not the true owners of our property. I thought that was... <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for reminding us. About and by that. the way, Robert, following you is always a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Let, and let me call upon uh, Norm. Okay, took a moment to uh, unmute myself. Um, just uh, simple, simplest of thoughts struck me that the Parsha is giving attention to pursuit and in in life and in in society there are things that we tend towards that we walk to sometimes we crawl to um, and there are the things that we run to and pursuit is is something it's it's about running to something or away from something and uh, demands a kind of attention and management that's uh, that's different than just tending towards things. Nice, that's nice. Well, there's a there's a level. Well, would you say that it's a level of uh, has to do with a level of 
passion, a, a level of intensity, a, a level of what? I would say passion is uh, something you will find very, very frequently in pursuit. Otherwise, yeah. why would you be doing yeah. it, you know? Great. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Let me call upon David and Susan. Um, I just wanted to say that in the uh, restraint of our Hopper uh, painting, in the middle of it is something that hit me immediately as active. And what hit me also was it made me think of the figurehead of a ship. Oh, yeah charging through the waves it's all there's almost a little bit of diving head first through the window that's fantastic you know i i, I wrote, this is exactly what i wrote in in the little commentary that went out late uh for yet yeah, late last night was that i what i saw too was the same thing the prow of a ship yeah. and the the figurehead on, on a ship you know heading towards and cutting through the waves and cutting through the sea uh, on a to a new port. So I appreciate appreciate that. Good. You still oh, want to say something? Don't, don't don't tell, but I I did steal it from you. <laughs> okay, very good. Won't, won't tell. Okay, great. Let me, Justin, did you did you want to share something? Uh, no. Oh, oh, oh. I I thank you, Rabbi. Um, I thought that Jay had made some very profound comments about just this notion of land uh, relationship. And I was just had a sense or an inkling of uh, Linda Ravenswood speaking about land use and how to relate to people uh, in that. And I was just wondering if there was any uh, any reflections that had come from Jay's comment. And that's a that's a big question. So to, but I'm just to me, the sense of responsibility around the land uh, that Jay Iser had spoken about was profound. So I just uh, wanted to lovely. That's lovely, lovely to like reflect that back uh, to all of us and, and to Jay in, in particular. And I guess I would like to, so many rich comments uh, have been shared. And so I would just like to maybe wrap things together by saying one of the things that struck me both as I was reading the portion and as I was listening and then really assimilating so, so many of your remarks has to do with how, what a wonder it is that our Torah text on the one hand acknowledges pe uh, that we have urges, that we have inclinations, and, and at the same time it is providing us some kind of image of what will happen if we allow those destructive, avaricious, dominating urges to, to, to rule us, uh, that we will, contrary to what we imagine, we won't satiate our hungers. We won't become satisfied. We won't feel fulfilled. We won't feel that we now have enough. The opposite will happen. We will become hungrier we will become more anxious, we will become more unsettled. And so it's trying to both ethically and, and artistically, if you will, prepare us and shape us and remind us uh, of the need uh, to live a life of fulfillment, which comes from living a life that's in harmony, in harmony with the land, in harmony with ourselves, in harmony with those around us, in harmony with the source that creates everything that exists. And uh, in a sense, H Hopper is trying to get us to take a time out, if you will, from the energy of the 20th century, from the energy of the locomotions and the automobiles and the airplanes and the war and the weapons of destruction it's trying to get us to slow down uh quiet ourselves down and just to behold to behold 
and to gaze, if you will, in wonder and in curiosity, in contemplation. And that is, in a sense, what Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel advised us to do. He says, we become so wrapped up, Heschel would say, in our acquisitiveness, in our con drive for consumption, that we lose our sense of enchantment about the world. And that, that what will sustain us will be to constantly live with a sense of wonder and enchantment, gratefulness and reverence and harmony. You all help me to do that. I'm so grateful that it's not only the written text that's before me, but it's all these beautiful faces and, and beautiful creativity and beautiful compassion uh, that helps rein me in from my moments of, of feeling I don't have enough uh, and, and that I'm not, I need to, need to bestir myself more. So thank you for helping to calm me down. Uh, and, and I hope that it's a, it's a contribution that you each feel from one another as well. God bless you all. I look forward to our regathering. Uh, be kind to yourselves, be kind to one another, and, uh, and indeed behold the trees around us. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you. you.